Hi, my name is Pete Calandra, and on today's video, I'd like to take a look at using orchestration to bring life, energy, and interest to your composition. While I'm not actually scoring a film in this episode, these principles aid the realization of a short film score, and actually, every film score. I talked about my concepts for short films in the previous two videos on this subject. If you'd like to explore them, there are links in the description box below. The three main areas that I find students and beginning film composers need work in is composing melodies and motives, writing music appropriate for the narrative, and orchestration. Orchestrations are used to mark out new sections or even subsections of music. They also are used to bring out inner voices and melodies and to create differing moods. A big part of orchestration is understanding the usage of articulations. A stringed instrument can take on a very different quality dependent upon the type of articulation or playing style used. Muted strings sound much different than Bartok pits, and they imbue a much different emotional intent. As part of this discussion, we'll take a look at the different short articulations and how to use them. I'll be doing this by using the Spitfire Audio Chamber Strings Ensemble Patch. We'll also discuss technical reasons as to why these playing techniques sound different. And finally, we'll hear this short piece I wrote played using each articulation and then see the difference created by using mixed articulations. I'll have timestamps for the different sections in the description box below. If you like this video, give a thumbs up. For more content, please subscribe and to be notified, ring that bell. Leave any questions or comments below. Thanks for watching and let's get started. Since today's video is focused on short articulations, let's take a look at the ones we'll be using. I have each version of this piece rendered as audio because I use this session as a teaching tool in my film scoring class at the Copeland School of Music and need to have it play on the computers at the school that do not have contact or this Spitfire library installed. So the first articulation is spiccato. It's an off the string at the sounding point technique of very small up and down bows originating from the wrist. It's almost like the bow is bouncing off the strings. Let's take a listen. The next one is staccato. This also is short. Usually there are small spaces between the notes, and this is an important articulation developed by the control of the bow from the second joint of the bow hand on the stick. This articulation has the notes sounding just a little bit longer than spiccato. Let's take a listen. little woofy down in the low end. We'll go back and forth between spiccato and staccato. So first spiccato, now staccato. All right, you can hear the notes are a little bit longer with the staccato. Spiccato again. Really crisp and precise with a lot of energy. A little bit more diffuse. So the next articulation that we have here is the consordino shorts. These are short articulations played with mutes on. 
a violin mute or a viola mute, cello mute, acoustic bass mute is a small accessory attached to the bridge of the instrument. Usually it's a small piece of rubber, but anything that dampens the vibrations of the bridge will work. As the name implies, a mute dampens the intensity of the sound of string instruments. It gets rid of some of the upper overtones. Let's take a listen to what this sounds like. Pizzicato, usually written as pits in the parts, P-I-Z-Z, plucking the string with the index finger of the right hand. Bartok pits, also called snap pits, where the right hand or the index finger of the right hand pulls the string away from the fingerboard and releases it, causing a snapping sound. Very percussive. Coleño, this is where the sound is produced by turning the bow upside down or turning the bow over and using the wood portion of the bow to strike against the strings. Again, percussive. If you're writing for string players and you write coleño, they typically do not like to do this very often and take some of the finish off the back of their bow. So be very aware of that when you're composing for real string players. One other and important short technique is marcato. I'm not sure it would fit in with a piece like this, and sadly it's missing from this ensemble patch, but just for reference, it indicates a short note played louder or more forcefully than the surrounding music. It's generally speaking longer sounding than staccato, so it's used for accenting, but the notes are still separated. One thing to keep in mind is that you can easily program pizzicato articulations that are way too fast to be played by humans. And I've done that in this piece. I'd be more careful if I was writing for live players, but this is for illustrative purposes. And as I said, if this was going to be played by real players, I'd be much more careful in how I orchestrate it. Now, all of these playing techniques create a different sound. The playing technique affects two parameters of that sound the amount of overtones heard, and also the envelope of the sound. I'll show you the overtone concept in a minute. For those of you not familiar with analog synthesis, an envelope is something quantified by Dr. Robert Moog in the 1960s to help his modular synthesizers shape the volume of a sound as it unfolded over time. Each musical instrument, as well as each different articulation, has a distinctive envelope. An envelope consists of four parts, attack, decay, sustain, and release, or ADSR, and envelopes shape the sound. Now, there are tutorials on YouTube that you can find that go into depth about envelopes and how important they are in sound creation, but just very briefly, attack is the amount of time it takes for a sound to go from no volume to peak volume, decay is the decrease in volume immediately after the attack that leads to the volume of the sustain. The sustain is the volume during the middle portion of the envelope just prior to its release. This is more of a time-based parameter since the volume or amplitude is the same during this part of the cycle. And release is when the instrument stops producing a sound, the time it takes for the instrument to stop vibrating or to come to a state of rest. The attack differences between these articulations are pretty easy to see. The other facets of the envelope are much more subtle. So we're just going to focus in first on the attack differences. And I've got something over here that will help us out. Let me scroll down. This is middle C played by each of the six articulations that we're looking at today. So this is spiccato. And then this one is staccato. And let's see if I can get all these on the screen. Yeah, there we go. You can clearly see that this is the peaks of the volume of the sound. And that takes, let's go to time-based here, 
52 milliseconds to get from no volume to peak volume. And on this one here, something about like that, it's taking 152 milliseconds or two and a half, three times as long. Let's listen to those two articulations in succession. Right, you can hear, bip, bip, right? You can really hear the difference in the articulation. Now, this is the concertino. And let's take a look at this. So that's about the peak volume. Right, 73. So it's closer to the spiccato, this one here, the way that it's been programmed and performed. Now that brings us over here to pizzicato, right? And this one is, let's see, from there to there, 24 milliseconds. We can see it right there. So that's half the time it takes the spiccato articulation. And it's the same for the other two short articulations, very quick. All right, so I've opened up a frequency analyst, and we're going to take a look at how each individual note plays out. This is middle C, which is about 261 hertz. And we'll see how the fundamental, which is in this area here, plays out and the kinds of overtones that are present in each articulation. So let's, here, let's try it from this, this one here. So the first articulation, spiccato, staccato, concertino shorts, pizzicato, Bartok pits, and coligno. Middle C is 261.63 hertz, approximately. It's close enough. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit. You can see here with the spiccato, the first one here, this is 250 hertz and this is volume. This fundamental pitch just gets a little bit above this second line here. Notice how much higher it is here. Additionally, you can see that this harmonic is much louder than this harmonic. This is about the same, but then this is starting to get more diffuse over here, and on the spiccato you have an additional sharp harmonic. So what that means is that the spiccato is a brighter sound than the staccato. The volume of the upper overtones indicates the timbre of the instrument, right? So with more overtones, the sound becomes more vibrant. It's easier to cut through a mix too. Now let's take a look at the consordino. And it's interesting here because even though this has a mute on it, this consordino short, you could see that it has much more defined overtones in this area here than the staccato does, right? These start getting diffused here where they're not lines are a little more curved, whereas these are very angular here. And again, notice on both of these, by the time we get up to about maybe 7,500, 8,000 hertz, your volume is almost inaudible. Let's see what happens with our pizzicatos. Now notice, this is just a regular pizzicato. Let's see if we can get both of these in here. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so the fundamental is very present in this. Notice, though, that it's got a wider frequency spectrum. It's almost like a wider, so the, the Q is different than on this right here. You could see it's got a wider angle. And then the overtones are not as present. It's a rounder sound. Let's compare that with the Bartok pits. And oh, you can tell quite a difference there. Here, let me make this bigger so we can see these two. I should have done that earlier, sorry. You can tell with the Bartok pits, look at the volume of these overtones, right? They're very present, very bright sound. And then with the Coligno, they're still present. And notice that they also, they go up way above 8,000, both of these. This one is just barely above 4,000. See how different that is? So you're getting different harmonics, different 
overtones. And you have to realize, too, that when you're composing and orchestrating as modern composers, you have to figure out how these different timbres are going to fit inside of a mix. And having some sort of knowledge of what kind of overtones each one of these articulations produces when you start to mix them in with other instruments, it becomes very helpful. There'll be a link in the description box below for this JPEG. If you'd like to take a look at it, download it for yourself, for your own knowledge, it'll be there for you. Okay, let's continue on with our different articulations. So we already heard the spiccato at the beginning of this. And now let's take a look at the staccato. Let's just play the end of the spiccato and then right into the staccato. So you can tell already, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but you could tell already how it doesn't have quite the same drive as the spiccato. Let me go back to measure one. Right, you can hear a difference there. Now our consordino short articulations. You can hear that it's got a little bit more drive, but it is muted. Where I like it is I like it in the melody right here. That's kind of cool sounding. It'd be nice to have something a little bit more driving down in the bottom, but we'll get to that. Let's go a little bit further ahead. Also, uh, before I forget, this is Pro Tools. I can see the notation here, and even though I've got this set up in C minor, it is not enharmonically correct. This should really be a G flat right here, and it's written as an F sharp. I, there's no way to really fix that in Pro Tools. What they want you to do is send this to Sibelius, and then you can fix it in Sibelius, which Avid also sells and makes. All right, let's move ahead to the pizzicato. This might be getting a little bit fast to be playing pizzicato with. I mean, just imagine, try to pluck on a tabletop your finger like that. So you have to be careful with that, but it's a cool effect here. I like it at the beginning also, right, in this area here. It's kind of nice. It's a little more mysterious. Reminds me a tiny bit of Bernard Herrmann. Moving forward, let's go to our Bartok pits. So you can hear in this area here, with this pedal point C in the top and then this descending figures underneath it, pyramiding down, that it doesn't really work, the Bartok pits. Now again, you got to imagine, you're, you're taking your index finger, you're putting it under the string, and you're lifting it up and snapping it, right? Can you really do that this fast? Not quite sure. But this is sample-based music, so I can do it. again. 
imagining writing for real humans. What you can do, though, is you can do a divisi where half of your cellos are playing spiccato and the other half are playing the Bartok pits, and they're only doing the accents. So you might get the spiccato going something like... Play by one part of your cello section, and then the other part doing the Bartok pits might do something like... And you could blend the two of those together. That kind of a thing works well on live players. And our last one is Colino. I think that this works well for accenting things and also for Divisi, using it in the same way that you'd use the Bartok pits. I think those are kind of really cool. Uh, and again, you gotta think, can you bounce the bow that fast? And would regular players want to subject their bows to that kind of treatment over a long period of time? We're gonna look at some mixed articulations. As I said in the prologue, your piece of music is a story and you want your story to unfold. And you want your orchestration to help with the narration and presentation of your song, your piece of music, your composition. A few of the concepts to get into your mind that will help you understand how to use orchestration to achieve this is when you use orchestration. You use orchestration to mark out the different sections, the different chapters of your book, the different sections of your story and you use orchestration to bring out things that would get covered up by having the same articulation played by all the instruments. What do I mean by that last one? Let's take a look right here in this section here. So I've got all of these Cs, just pedal pointing here for two measures, right? Then I've got an inner line, B flat, A flat, G, G, F, E flat, and then there's another inner line e flat repeated d flat uh, sorry e flat repeated d c b flat right and this is sort of a, a a descending pyramid and so you might want your orchestration if this is all being played by strings to bring out the line that you think is the most important here and then when we get here instead of it being stepwise i've got a d major triad that's being arpeggiated d a f sharp and d so I'll change the articulation there to bring that line out. Okay, so these are, that's what I mean by bringing out the inner voices in your piece. Another example is right here. I've got this line here. Let me unmute this. Right here. So you could think of this as... Right? And then, which would be these first four notes, the D flat and the C, and then on the off beats, mm, ba, mm. right? So if I were to play that in octaves in my right hand, the A flat and the B flat, and then on the next measure, so you'll want to bring out the A flat, the B flat, the C, and the D even though this looks like a single, that's actually a polyphonic line. Those are the ways that you can use orchestration to bring out all the different facets that's inside of your piece. So that means that you really need to know what your piece is doing, what's going on in your piece, dive into it. Just don't write notes without understanding what's going on in the inside part of your music. One other thing I want to talk about here at the end, which is an important concept for my music in general, is that right here at measure 281, I've got these very rich chords. If I were to look at those chords and try to analyze them, the first chord is D flat, 
A flat, F, which is a D flat major triad. And then on the right hand, I've got B flat, C, and G. If you wanted to analyze that, somebody might call it a D flat major seventh with a sixth and a sharp 11th. That's technically right, but that's really pedantic and it becomes a little difficult to conceive of. So how do I think of things like this? I think of these as two three note structures. I've got a D flat triad and then I've got this structure here. What is that structure? Well, that's, if I line that up differently, if I take that top note and drop it down, it's G flat, B flat, and C, right? So that's a G, G minor with a fourth or just like a little sus kind of a, a sound. And I've just got a different inversion of that. And I'm just moving that shape up scale wise. Right, so this is how you can create really complex. Uh, and then this last one is, right? And then just a suspended chord. And then I've got that A in there to give you a little bit more. So I'm gonna do a lesson on harmony. There are so many different kinds of ways to think about harmony, and the more of them you know, and study, and ingest, and internalize, the more that you can call on those when you're creating music and you're not stuck into one way of thinking. But one of the main things I do is I've got my shells or my lower structures in my left hand and I've got three note chords in my right hand. So even simply, if I just took the bottom, the D flat and the A flat, right, I'm just playing intervals in my left hand and I'm moving that, this structure around stepwise, and it creates really interesting harmonies. The trick, though, is to learn how to make these harmonies work in a progression of one all the way through to the last one that you're going to write. So in other words, if you've got a passage here where I've got one, two, three, four, five, six different chords that lead to this C suspended chord, how do you get from the first one to this one here and make all of these unusual voicings work as a progression? So let's take a look at our first mixed articulation. I wrote this in 2016, and I'm presenting it now. I would do some of these differently now, but it's still good for showing the concepts I'm presenting here. listening to this, if I was going to criticize myself and grade myself, I don't like the short concertinos here, the way it's pl played and performed, and I'm not sure I like the pizzicato right at the opening. So what I think I would do at the beginning here a little bit differently is I would either use Coligno and blend that in to just do some accents, and I would do that with a Divisi section for live performance, and I'm not sure I like this. The notes are a little, ringing a little bit too long. I really would like to have the notes be shorter. Did it, did it, did it, did it. Right, so here's a new section right here, and I've changed the orchestration.
what I did here is instead of changing the articulation on this, I made this much more accented up here. And then over here, I started changing the articulation. And again, I don't know if this can be played by humans with the very fast Bartok pits. Right, we change key here. We go up to A flat and change the articulation. Using the Bartok picks. No, I'm actually using the Colino to accent some here. You can see it right here. Let's take a listen to how that sounds. And how that blends with the pizzicato. Right, so it's playing this last eighth note here. These low notes. Right, so that's kind of cool. Let's move on to the second orchestration, mixed articulations, right here. Okay, one more time. So we start off with staccato with accents with the Bartok pits. Right, so I'm accenting into the downbeat, which is another important concept when you want your music to move forward. You want to, things to phrase into an event. So here, I'm phrasing into the downbeat. So it's one, two, three, four, uh-uh, two, three, four, uh-uh, right? Two, three, four. So if we listen to the aggregate of that. get rid of these the Bartok pitzes I'm going to just mute those because I don't like those once the yeah see I like that better and then maybe I'll have them come back in here So what I mean by phrasing into an event is we're starting here on the and of four. We've displaced everything over an eighth note, and we're going from here to the downbeat at 367. And let me unmute the rest of these and see what my original orchestration sounded like. So notice here, I'm accenting these low notes with the Colino. One more time. Right, so this is the first time through, it's with the Bartok pits. <laughs> That's a funny sound. And then the second time through, with the Colinos coming in here, helping to bring out some of that lower line. Which is kind of cool. And then the Bartok Pits comes in after that. All right? Give me these last three notes. And the aggregate of all that together. You see here how I'm bringing out these notes? And bringing out these notes with the spiccato articulation, I believe. Oh, I'm starting it here this time. I see, I'm doing a little variation. So that the first time it's these two notes, then I'm going back to this one and overlapping. And the last time I'm actually starting here with all the offbeats with the spiccato. All 
And again, I'm not sure they can play the Coligno this fast here. But that still that sounds really cool. <laughs> you can really see how that drives the piece. Let's take a look at the Bartok pits on this transition towards the end. Literally phrasing right into the downbeat here. And let's listen to that with the Colanio going forward. Notice the layering here, and then all of that together. That brings us to the end of this lesson. I hope that you found some useful information here. Like, subscribe, and ring that bell. Leave any questions and comments below. I've been Pete Calandra. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.